Hello, I'm going to walk you through uh, setting up a user interface for a simple two-player game. This is uh, the even and odd game, which you should be familiar with from the test. I'm not going to show you the NIM game itself, because I think I give away a little too much if I actually uh, make a user inter interface for that game. So I'll show it to you with the even and odd game, which you know really is actually quite similar. It, the only difference is instead of having three piles with three, four, and five in each pile, you've got one pile with 15, and then the players are taking away into their own piles. And if you recall from the uh, test, the way you win the game is you want to be the person that ends up with an even number in your own pile. It doesn't matter whether you're the last player to go or whether, um, you know, who finished first. Uh, it, it just all depends on who ends up with the even number in their pile. So I've got two classes here, the even and odd class and the user interface class. The even and odd class is pretty much just exactly the same as from the test. We'll quickly go through it here. Uh, we got the four variables that you needed. You need uh, the, the one variable that holds how many is in the central pile, how many player one has, how many player two has, and then one variable to keep track of whose turn it is. Got a constructor that just sets up the game to its initial state. I've got four getters here, one uh, for each one of the variables here. I'm going to need that because the user interface has to be able to display that information. It needs to be able to know whose turn it is. It needs to be able to know uh, how many is each one of the piles. So I have a getter for each one of those variables. And then I have a method called move. It's pretty much as I described in the test. It's given the player number and how many they're taking. And um, it does a bunch of checks to make sure that, that it's the correct player uh, playing that move. It returns false if the, uh, if it was not a correct move. There's one called isGameOver that determines if the game is over, and then finally one called who won that returns 0, 1, or 2, just like uh, with your NIM game. So let me show you this user interface in action. Here we go. I, I just whipped this together. It's just about as uh, bare bones as you can make it. We've got the central pile with 15. Player 1 has 0 in their pile, and player 2 has 0 in their pile. You type in a number, uh, you know, let's say 3, you click on Take, and then it moves the three into player one, takes away three from the central pile. And then the other player you know, can maybe play two, and then this just goes back and forth uh, until somebody wins. So let's just take this all the way down really quickly here. So there's three left, we'll do three here. And it says player two wins <clears throat> because player two ended up with an even number. Uh, let's do that one more time. And I'll show you that also if uh, let's say player one tries to take four, it says bad move. Um, maybe they try to take negative three, oops, negative three. That's, all, that's also a bad move. If then they get it right, uh, that goes away, and then it actually ends up you know, taking the two away. And then if player one tries to go again, it says bad move. So basically, it, it just, it, it's using um, uh, the, uh, the move function to tell you whether or not it was a bad move, and then if that returns false, it just displays this message. Okay, so that's the user interface. Let's go take a look at the code to make that work. Uh, let's uh, drag, so you can, yep, let's put this over in the corner, and let's bring this here where you can see it. All right, uh, so we got a bunch of imports at the top, and these are just to, to bring in the various classes that we need to put the whole user interface together. Here I've got uh, a bunch of variables that, that correspond with the various user interface elements. So I've got a J label here called pile player one and player two. These are the three labels up at the top that represent how many are in each pile. I've got the two text, text fields, P1 quantity and P2 quantity. That's uh, these two here in the middle. So P1 quantity is the one on the left and P2 quantity is the one on the right. And then a canvas, of course, for the, the whole thing and a label called bad move, which is the one that, that, that appears down there. And then I have the model, the even and odd game itself, as a variable that the user interface gets access to. The constructor just makes a new even and odd game. And you know the constructor for even and odd sets up the game, so it puts 15 in the central pile and 0 in the, the two player piles. And then we start the game. So let's take a look at init. Init, of course, is what uh, start ends up calling. So you call start in the constructor, and then start calls init. So let's walk through this kind of line at a time. The first thing we do is we make a canvas, and we add it to the window. So now I've got something that I can put uh, my graphics on. Uh, next, I need to make those three labels. I have the variables for those three labels, uh, pile, player one, and player two. But now I need to actually make the labels themselves. 
And the way I uh, fill in the values that go in those labels is I have to make a string out of what get pile, get player one, and get player two are returning. These are re each returning integers from the model, and then I need to make a string out of them by just uh, adding it to the empty string. So that becomes the contents of the label when the game first starts. I also want to change the font. This is, you know, I think it starts out being like Arial or Helvetic or something like that. So I change it to Comic Sans, uh, bold, and 24 point. So I set that to be the font for the uh, pile and also the font for the player one and player two. So I use this one font object called pile font and then I assign it over and over again to each one of those things so that all three of them have the same font. That way if I ever want to change uh, the font that all three of these ones use, like I want to change this to, I don't know, Verdun or something like that, I just have to change it in one place and all three of them will change. And then I add those three uh, labels to the canvas uh, right here. Next, the text fields. I make the two J text field objects and the two here as an argument to the constructor tells it how wide the field is going to be. This says it's going to be basically two characters wide, which is more than enough. Um, you really only need one, but I want it to be big enough so that the player can see it on the screen. And then I add them into the canvas. Next, the buttons. Uh, I have a P1 take, that's a button, and its label is take. Uh, whoops, scrolled up a little too far there, sorry. Here we go. And then I also associate with that button an action command. That's that string that gets associated with the button. So when I click on the button, that string gets passed in through the event to my event handler. And the action command is called take one. So if the string that I get back from the event is take one, I'll know that this button was, was clicked. If it's take two, I'll know that the other button was clicked. So the two buttons are very similar, they've got the same label, but the action command is different on them. And then I add them to the canvas. Uh, last is, and this is a little uh, trick that I use here, is that bad move label, I put that on the screen initially, right here. So I make the label, I set the font right here, I add it to the canvas, and then I make it invisible. So it's actually there all the time, I just show it and hide it depending upon whether I need it to appear. So rather than making a new label every time that the user makes a bad move, I have this one label that I just show and hide. And the last thing I do in init is add all those action listeners, which sets up all the buttons to be clickable. All right, and so that's init. Let's go look at action performed. This method gets invoked when somebody clicks on a button. It receives an action event from the operating system. Um, this is just a, a class name, so it's a type, and the variable name is E. Inside of the method, the first thing I do is I fetch that string that comes out from the action event. So that, that string for this game is either going to be take one or take two. So get action command fetches that string and then I assign it to a variable called action. And then I, I just do an if on it. So if the action is take one, then I want to do this stuff here. If it's take two, I want to do this stuff. And then it, there should never be any other possibility there, but I've left an else in here so that if I have maybe like a, a third button or a fourth button, I can quickly put in some additional conditions there for that. Okay, let's go back and look at uh, the action for take one. So, um, so, so I say if the action command was take one, I know that the first button was clicked, and so that corresponds with player one taking something out of there. So uh, what I do is I fetch the text out of the, the, the player one quantity field, which is th this one over here on the left, and then I run it through a method called integer.parseint, which takes that string that's inside of the field and converts it to an integer. And then I assign it to a variable called quantity. So let's run through that again. So I, I fetch the text out of the text field, I convert it to an integer, and then I assign it to a variable called quantity. And then since this is the player one move, I know that I need to invoke the move method on the even odd ob, um, a model with one for the player number, because this is player one, and this is how many they took. And I've got this wrapped up in a condition. If this returns true, I know that it was a good move, and if it returns false, I know it was a bad move. <clears throat> now, uh, if it was a good move, regardless of whether player one or player two went, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to update all the stuff that appears on the screen. Uh, when I click, normally if I click on the take button and I, and I just call move but don't react to it, nothing's going to happen on the screen. No, none of the numbers are going to change. Um, 
uh, none of the messages are going to appear. So I've called this method called update labels. Now, the reason why I did that was because no matter whether player one or player two goes, it's going to be the same labels I'm going to be updating. Um, I need to basically update all three of them. Actually, really, when player one goes, I only need to update player one and the central one. And when player two goes, I only need to update player two and the central one. But why not just update all three of them and get the job done? So if it was a good move, I'm going to update all the labels on the screen. And if it was a bad move, I'm going to call this method called bad move. Actually, let's go look at that one right now, because that one is really short. That's all the way at the bottom here. So bad move, all it does is it makes that, that label that I set up earlier and made it invisible, it just makes it visible. That's all it does. Um, when does it become not visible? You'll see in just a moment. Uh, let's go back to update labels here. So this gets called when all the when the move is good. So we'll scroll down here to update labels. And it's pretty short. It just fetches the new uh, amount from the central pile. It fetches the new amount that player one has, the new amount that player two has. It also clears out the two text fields so they're ready for some new input. It makes the bad move visible, uh, excuse me, invisible. And um, the reason why I know I can do that is because update labels only gets called when it was a good move. So I want to make that label invisible because I, it's no longer a bad move. <clears throat> and then the last thing I do, uh, I need to uh, resize the labels. And the reason for that is at some point in the game, one of these two labels here, and it may not happen in every game, but what might, might happen is either the player one label or the player two label becomes two digits long. Like maybe player two ended up with 10 and player one ended up with five. Uh, what's going to happen is it won't display the whole 10 there. What you'll get is just a bunch of, it's just like, I think, two or three dots there, which says there's text here, but the label, the amount of space that the operating system allocated for it is not big enough to show the whole label. So I need to tell the user interface to resize the label, to resize the kind of the bounding box around the label so that it's now big enough to show the whole number. The way we do that is we ask the label, how big would you like to be? That's called its preferred size. How big would it like to be? And then we set its size to be that size. We do the same thing for the other label and for the central pile as well. Might as well do all three of them. OK, so, so if you know that the numbers or the text in a label might get to be bigger than how, what it was when it, when it was originally set up, you need to use this little technique here to ask the label, how big would you like to be, and then change its size. OK, so that's update labels, and that's pretty much the whole game. Um, what we do is we use init to set up the canvas and set up the initial state of the game that the user sees. And then we use action perform to react to button clicks. If the person clicked on the take one button, we're going to go and fetch how many was in that field, invoke the method on the, on the model, see whether it was a good move, update the labels if it was, display the bad move label if it wasn't. Same thing for take two. It's pretty much exactly the same. The only difference is the number that I put in here for the, uh, the move method. After they move, it's a good move. Update all the labels. If it's a bad move, uh, go ahead and invoke bad, bad move. And then uh, that's the whole game. Um, let's see. There's one more thing, which is how does it display the winner? Oh, oh I see. That's right here. I, I missed that. So uh, regardless of whether the player clicked on take one or take two, uh, afterwards, I want to see if, if, as a result of that move, if the game is now over. Now, if it was a bad move, the game won't be over, so nothing's going to happen here. But if it was a good move, I'm going to ask the model, is the game over? And if it returns true, I'm going to make a label that says player, and then I ask the model for the player number of who won. So it's going to return a one or a two. And it's going to insert that into the string. So the string is going to be player you know, one or two, and then the word wins. So player one wins or player two wins. I set the font, set the font here, and then put it on the screen. And the reason why I didn't set this up as being like kind of like the bad move one with an, a visible or invisible is that it's only going to appear once. The way to get a new game, at least in my kind of quick and dirty user interface, is you just got to close the window and start the game over again. Um, I'm thinking maybe in your NIM game, you might have a button somewhere on the screen that says like new game, and it, instead of closing the window, it will just reset the game. So just create a new NIM object, update the labels, and now a new game is, has gone, it is started. Okay, so, so that's how we're going to make the user interface. I showed this to you for the even and odd game. Like I said, the NIM game is going to be really similar. 
You might want to set up your user interface class kind of the same way I did. Uh, in fact, I've probably scrolled through it enough times that you can see the whole thing. I'll just quickly scroll through it here, again, kind of slowly so that you can kind of get, take a good look at it. Um, again, we got imports at the top. We got a class that extends program, a bunch of variables for um, fields and buttons that both the init and the action perform method need to get access to. Here's the init method, which sets up all the buttons and all the text fields. And um, there's the bottom half of it. And then finally, here's action performed, <coughs> which fetches the action command out of the event and then does an if else to figure out what event uh, or what button was clicked. And then the bottom half of it, which checks to see if the game is over and displays a label accordingly. And then finally, update labels and bad move, which um, yeah, update the screen after a move has been made. Okay, so that's how you put the user interface together. Um, I will uh, see you guys next time in class.